looking at consolidations. Okay, so, so far you have done week one to five, sorry, week one to four of consolidations. Today we're going to be doing um, week five, okay? And here we're going to deal with consolidations after acquisition. So the basic consolidation procedures that you've learned previously remain the same. So step one, you're going to um, eliminate the investment in the subsidiary. And then step two, you're going to eliminate the common or intra-group items. And then step three, you're going to do a consolidation of the remaining non-common items on a line-by-line -line basis in the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income and the statement of financial position. So in this week, we're going to be looking specifically at consolidations after acquisition. So where a subsidiary was purchased prior to the current reporting period, so in a prior period, we need to analyze the subsidiary's closing retained earnings, and we need to split it into pre-acquisition profits and post-acquisition profits. So pre-acquisition profits, this is the retained earnings of the subsidiary at acquisition, and then post-acquisition profits will be profits earned after acquisition. So the post-acquisition profits then need to be further analyzed and divided into post-acquisition profits from the acquisition to the beginning of the current period and then post-acquisition profits for the current period. So what happens is that the um, subsidiary would have been purchased in a previous reporting period. So we will have a profit in the current year and we will have a profit in the prior year after acquisition. So we need to split the post-acquisition profits into um, those two parts. So both of these categories of post-acquisition profits must then be further analyzed and divided into post-acquisition profits attributable to the parent and the post-acquisition profits attributable to the non-controlling interest. Okay, so we still need to split it between the parent and the non-controlling interest. So pre-acquisition profits these are profits earned by the subsidiary before the parents obtained control of the subsidiary, so before acquisition. Therefore, these profits do not um, are not attributable to the group. These are referred to as purchased profits, and they form part of the equity of the subsidiary that will be eliminated on acquisition. Oh, sorry. Okay, I see the slides are not changing. Uh, let me just quickly, sorry, I thought I was sharing the slides. Uh, let me just stop sharing and then I'll share again. Okay, so we're on slide um, seven. Okay, we're on slide seven. Okay, so it's just theory. Um, so you can just um, catch up. So remember I said that the pre-acquisition profits, these are profits earned by the subsidiary before the parents obtained control of the subsidiary. Therefore, they do not form part of the profits attributable to the group. So these are purchase profits 
um, they form part of the equity of the subsidiary that is eliminated on acquisition. So remember, um, when we have an at acquisition, the pro forma journal entries, we eliminate the retained earnings on acquisition. So this pre acquisition profits will form part of the retained income that will be eliminated on acquisition. So then we are also going to eliminate the uh, common or intra-group items. Okay, so these are all of the pro forma journal entries that you're used to. So the journal entry to eliminate the equity of the subsidiary, including the pre-acquisition profits of the subsidiary at acquisition against the investment in subsidiary in the parent is debit share capital and debit retained earnings. So in this retained earnings, your pre-acquisition profits will sit in the retained earnings and therefore you can see it's being eliminated. Um, we are going to debit any other reserves or equity. And then we are going to determine if we have goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. And then we are going to credit the investment in the subsidiary. And we are going to credit the non-controlling interest. OK, so these pro forma journal entries these journal entries will be familiar to you and we're still going to do that. We just now splitting the profit into pre acquisition profits and post acquisition profits. So here we have um, an example or a picture. So we have P group and in this scenario here we have SPTY limited and PPTY limited. So S has a closing balance of retained earnings of 24,000 and P has a closing balance of retained earnings of 70,000. So the closing balance for um, S is 24,000. And now we are going to split this into the pre-acquisition profit and the post-acquisition profit. So included in that closing balance of retained earnings will be an amount of profit that was earned before um, the subsidiary was acquired. And there'll be an amount that is post-acquisition that is after the subsidiary was acquired. So you can see that they have split their closing balance of retained earnings of 24,000 into the pre-acquisition portion, which is 4,000, and the post-acquisition portion, which is 20,000. Then that post-acquisition portion, that is going to be split between the current year profits, okay, and the amount that relates to the period after acquisition to beginning of the current year. So remember, in this scenario, the subsidiary could have been bought two years ago, so they were not bought in the current year. Um, so therefore, that post-acquisition profit of 20000 you need to ask yourself what amount of this was earned in the current year profit. And you can see the current year profit is shown as 8,000 Rand. And then the current year dividend is shown as 2,000 Rand. And then whatever is left over after you take out the current year profit from the post acquisition amount, whatever is left over is going to be for the period after acquisition to the beginning of the current year. So in this scenario, we can say the post acquisition amount was 20,000 and we have minus um, the current year profit less the dividend, which is 6,000. Therefore, the amount of 14,000 relates to the period after acquisition up to the beginning of the current period. OK, so this is just a diagram to show you um, how we're going to work this out. So the post acquisition profits, these are profits earned by the subsidiary after the parent has obtained control of the subsidiary. That is why they are called post acquisition. So the post acquisition profits, these are distributable profits from the point of view of the group. However, the post acquisition profits are not available for distribution by the parent until they are distributed by the subsidiary as a dividend. Okay. 
So the post acquisition profits that are part of the opening balance of the retained earnings for the period in which the consolidation takes place, these must be further separated from the pre acquisition profits included in the subsidiary's opening balance of the retained earnings. So the post acquisition profits of the subsidiary must be included in the group's opening balance of retained earnings in the consolidated statement of changes in equity and the statement of financial position. So here we have an example, a lecture example one. So PPTY Limited bought 100% of the equity of S on 1 Jan 2017. P Limited's opening balance of retained earnings on 1 Jan 2020 is 500,000 Rand. S had an opening balance of retained earnings on 1 Jan 2020 of 180,000. So if S's retained earnings at acquisition was 40,000, what will the opening balance in the retained earnings column of the consolidated statement of changes in equity be for the year ended 31 December 2020? So we now need to work out what is the opening balance in the retained earnings column um, for the year ended 31 December 2020, okay? So we now need to see, well, what information are we given? Remember, we are working out the opening balance in the consolidated statement of changes in equity in the retained earnings column. So we are going to take this 500,000 over here. So that is going to be one component. We need to take 100% of the opening balance of the retained earnings for P, which is 500,000. And then remember, we also need to include the opening balance of retained earnings for S of 180,000. But remember, this opening balance, not all of it occurred after acquisition. So they told us that S's retained earnings at acquisition was 40,000. So these are the pre acquisition profits. So we want to know what relates to the subsidiary because only um, the amount after acquisition will be included in the opening balance. So we need to take out the pre-acquisition profits. So for S, we're going to take the total opening balance of retained earnings on 1st of Jan 2020, which is 180,000. And we're going to subtract the retained earnings at acquisition. And then this will give us a post acquisition retained earnings of 140,000. So therefore, we want to know what is the opening balance in the consolidated statement of changes in equity. So we're going to add the 500,000 plus the 140,000, and that will give us an opening balance of 640,000. So that is just to work out the opening balance. But remember, we need to um, look at all of the calculations. So um, what happens to the in the rest of the consolidation procedure? So the basic consolidation procedures remain the same. We're still going to eliminate the investment in the subsidiary against the equity of the subsidiary. Then we're still going to eliminate common or intra-group items like any dividends. And step three, we're going to do a consolidation of the remaining non-common items on a line-by-line -line basis in the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income and the consolidated statement of financial position. Then once we have done those two statements, we're going to prepare a statement of changes in equity um, before or after a consolidated statement of financial position. Okay. So we're going to prepare those statements. Obviously, the statement of financial position and statement of changes in equity, they need to agree to each other. So um, you can do um, just make sure they agree to each other. So here we have lecture example two. PPTY Limited bought 80% of the equity of S on 1 Jan 2018. P paid 720,000 Rand. 
So that is the consideration paid. And on acquisition, S had share capital of 500,000 and retained earnings of 380,000. All the assets and liabilities of S were considered to be fairly valued at acquisition. P's closing balance of retained earnings on 31 December 2020 was 1.5 million. S's closing balance of retained earnings on 31 December 2020 was 900,000. In the year ending 31 December 2020, P made a profit after tax of 400,000 and declared dividends of 40,000. S made a profit after tax of 220,000 and declared dividends of 20,000. Then they're giving us information for the cash generating unit. They say the recoverable amounts of the cash generating unit were as follows. 31 December 2019, the cash generating unit had a recoverable amount of 896,000. And on 31 December 2020, the cash generating units had a recoverable amount of 894,000 Rand. There were no goodwill impairments in 2018. Okay, so they've given us a lot of information here, but let's just have a look um, at a diagram to help us break it down, okay? So in this scenario, we have P and we have S, okay? So first of all, P obtained 80% of the equity of S. So we know that S um, is a subsidiary and is controlled by P. So we are told that the closing balance of retained earnings for P is 1.5 million, and that was given in the scenario. And the closing balance for S is 900,000. So we now need to split that 900,000 into the pre-acquisition profits and the post-acquisition profits. So when we go to the scenario, they told us that the retained earnings of S on acquisition was 380,000. So we know that that consists of profit that was earned before acquisition. So the pre-acquisition um, profits um, in that closing balance of retained earnings is 380,000. And then we, we need to work out what is the post-acquisition profits. And we can work that out by saying 900,000, which is the closing balance of retained earnings, minus the pre-acquisition profits, which is 380,000. That will give us post-acquisition profits of 520,000. But remember that the subsidiary wasn't bought um, in the current year. So the post-acquisition profits then need to be split into the current period profits and the portion that was made after acquisition to the beginning of the current year. So that post-acquisition profits of 520,000, we need to ask ourselves what portion of that was made in the current year. So they told us in the scenario here, S made a profit of 220,000 and declared dividends of 20,000. So the current year profit is 220,000, less current year dividends of 20,000. So that is the current year profit. Then if we take that out of the 520,000, we'll say 520,000 minus the current year amount, which is 200,000, that will give us an amount of 320,000. Now the 320,000, this relates to profits that were earned after acquisition to the beginning of the current year. Okay, so we need to split it out because in our analysis of owner's equity, we need to, um, in our analysis of owner's equity, we're going to show this all separately in the different components. So let's carry on with uh, lecture example two. So in order to calculate the opening balance in the retained earnings column of the consolidated statement of changes in equity for the year ending 31 December 2020, 
um, we need to split S's opening balance between the pre-acquisition profits and the post-acquisition profits, which is what we did in that diagram. Then we need to separate the current year profit less the dividend from the post-acquisition profits to get the retained earnings from acquisition to the beginning of the current period. Then we're going to allocate the non-controlling interest, their share of the profits. So in order to do all of this, we need to do an analysis of equity. Okay, so this is going to help us. And in a test or exam, you must do this. Okay. There will be marks allocated to it. Even if they don't ask for it, you must do it because um, it is your working and it will ensure that you get the maximum amount of marks possible. Okay. So here, we this is the analysis of equity of S. So we are going to take the share capital of S on 1st of Jan 2018. And the scenario told us that the share capital was 500,000. And the retained earnings of S on that date was 380,000. And P owns 80% of this. So we're going to give P 80% of the share capital. So P will get 400,000. And the retained earnings, P will take 80% of the retained earnings on acquisition, and that will give them 304,000 rand. Then the non-controlling interest, which is 20%, uh, they will get 20% of the share capital on acquisition and 20% of the retained earnings. So the non-controlling interest um, total on acquisition will be 176,000. Now we need to compare what uh, P has purchased, which is 704,000 Rand worth of equity versus what they paid. So P paid 720,000 on acquisition. So we are comparing the consideration paid to the amount that P got. So we're saying 720,000 is what P paid, they got 704,000. So here um, they paid more than what they got, it seems. Therefore, we know that there is goodwill um, as a result of this acquisition. So the goodwill is 16,000 Rand. Okay, so that is at acquisition. You guys should all be familiar with that. Now we have two other sections. We have B. This is after acquisition, before the current year, and then we have C, which is the current year, okay? So if we go to the current year first, it's always easier to do C than B, so do A, and then we'll do C, and then C will help us do B. So if we do part C, which is the current year, the scenario told us that S made a profit of 220,000, and they declared a dividend of 20,000. So again, P is going to get 80% of the profit after tax. P will get 176,000. And then P will also take 80% of the dividend. So we'll go 20,000 times 80%, and that gives us 16,000 Rand. And then non controlling interest is 20%. So the non-controlling interest will take profit after tax of 220,000 times 80%, and that will give us the non-controlling interest of 44,000, and then the dividend of 20,000 multiplied by 80%, that will give us, um, sorry, 20,000 multiplied by 20%, which is the non-controlling interest portion, that will give us 4,000. Then we have a goodwill impairment, okay? And we'll go to the calculation in a minute for the goodwill impairment. But just remember that the goodwill impairment um, is going to be processed and the calculations we'll go through just now will show that we had an impairment loss of goodwill of 1,600 in the current year. Okay, so that is the current year. Now let's have a look at the B part, which is the between section. So here we have retained earnings, okay? And we're going to start with the closing balance um, of the retained earnings of 900,000. So the closing balance of the retained earnings 
of 900,000 is going to be our starting point, okay? So we're going to say 900,000 Rand. Then we want to strip out the, the pre-acquisition profits and then the current year profits. So let's first strip out the current year profit because we just did that. So remember the current year profit, if we take profit of 220,000 minus the dividends of 20,000, that gives us a profit of 200,000. So that profit is going to go here of 200,000. And then we're going to minus the 380,000, which is the retained earnings on acquisition. This is the pre-acquisition profits. So if we say 900,000 minus 200,000 minus 380,000, that will give us 320,000. 80% of that will go to P, and then 20% of that will go to the non-controlling interest. Then we have our impairment for goodwill, and we'll go through the calculation of that. Okay, so when we have a situation where the subsidiary was acquired um, maybe like two years ago, when we do our analysis of owner's equity, you have to have an at acquisition part, a between section, and a current year section. So now that we have done the analysis of owner's equity, now we can move on um, to some pro forma journal entries and the calculation of goodwill. OK, so let's first have a look at the calculation of goodwill. So here we have to calculate the net asset value. So remember, we are calculating the carrying amount of the cash generating unit. And then we are comparing it to the recoverable amount to see if the cash generating unit needs to be impaired. So the share capital on acquisition was 500,000. The retained earnings on acquisition was 380,000. And that will give us a net asset value of 880,000. And remember, we calculated goodwill as 16,000. But remember, that goodwill only represents an 80% shareholding. So we need to gross it up to 100%. So we'll go 16,000 divided by 80 times 100, and that will give us 20,000. And that 20,000 represents 100% of the goodwill. So if we add the share capital and retained earnings plus the goodwill, the grossed up goodwill, that will give us a carrying amount of 900,000. If we compare that carrying amount of 900,000 to the recoverable amount that was given to us in the scenario, we can see that the carrying amount is greater than the recoverable amount. So we are going to have an impairment um, to the value of the difference between the carrying amount and the recoverable amount. So the impairment loss is 4,000 Rand, and then we have to give the parent 80% of that. So we'll say the parent share of the impairment is 4,000 multiplied by 80%, and that will give us 3,200. Okay, so that is the impairment loss on 31 December 2019. We also need to calculate the impairment loss on 31 December 2020. So remember, on 31 December 2020, we had goodwill of 16,000, but it was already impaired in 2019. The impairment was 3,200. So now the amount of goodwill at 31 December 2020 is 12,800. So here we have a net asset value of 880,000, and that is made up of the share capital of 500,000 in the scenario, and the retained earnings on acquisition of 380,000. So that will give us a net asset value of 880,000. Now we need to add in the goodwill, but remember the carrying amount of goodwill is 12,800. That represents an 80% shareholding. So we need to gross this up. So we'll go 12,800 divided by 80%, multiplied by 100%, and that will give us 16,000 Rand. The carrying amount will be the net asset value plus the goodwill, 
And so the carrying amount will be 896,000 Rand. And we need to compare that to the recoverable amount on 31 December 2020. So they told us in the scenario, the recoverable amount was 894,000. Therefore, the recoverable amount is lower than the carrying amount. So we're going to bring the carrying amount down to the recoverable amount, which means the impairment loss is 2,000 Rand. But remember, this impairment, we need to ask ourselves, what portion does the parent get? So the parent owns 80%. So the parent share of the goodwill is going to be 80%. So we'll say 2,000 Rand multiplied by 80%, and this will give us 1,600 Rand. So those are the impairments for 2019 and 2020. So we need to now um, use that information to do the pro forma journal entries. So the pro forma journal entries to account for the annual goodwill impairment. In 2019, we remember um, when we do the consolidation every year, it's as if we're starting from scratch. So when we process the impairment relating to goodwill in 2019, we're going to be debiting retained earnings. So we're going to debit retained earnings 3,200 Rand, and we're going to credit accumulated impairment loss goodwill with 3,200 Rand. Then in the current year, remember we have the current year impairment of 1,600 Rand. We are going to debit impairment loss 1,600 Rand and credit impairment loss 1,600 Rand. So both of these impairments were shown in our analysis um, of owner's equity. So remember we had the impairment in 2019 and the impairment in 2020. Okay, so now what do we do? We've done our analysis of owner's equity, we've done the impairment calculations, and we've processed journal entries for that. Now we need to do our pro forma journal entries. So here we are going to eliminate the investment in S um, against the equity of S. So we're going to debit share capital with 500,000. This was the share capital on acquisition. And we're going to debit retained earnings with 380,000, which was also the amount on acquisition. Remember, we calculated goodwill in our analysis of owner's equity of 16,000. So we're going to debit goodwill. Goodwill is an asset and it is shown in the statements of financial position. Then we're going to credit the investment in S with 720,000. This was the amount that it was purchased for. And we're going to create a non-controlling interest with 176,000 Rand. That is the NCI's portion. So this journal entry, this is based on part A of the analysis of owner's equity. So all the amounts in that pro forma journal entry is going to be over here in part A. Okay. Now we need to process um, uh, another pro forma journal entry. So here we are going to account for the non-controlling interest share of the subsidiary's post acquisition retained earnings up to the beginning of the current year. So if you look at this amount, the 64,000, where does this come from? So this comes from the part B section. So here, remember we had that period after acquisition before the current year that resulted in a retained earnings of 320,000. We need to give the non-controlling interest their share of that. So our journal entry is going to be for 64,000. So we're going to debit retained earnings 64,000 and we're going to credit non-controlling interest with 64,000. Then we need to look at the current year and say to ourselves, well, how much did we make in the current year? Are we going to give NCI a portion of that too? 
So in the current year, we had a profit after tax of 220,000 and the NCI gets 20% of that. So we need to show a journal and give NCI their share of the current year profit. So we are going to debit non-controlling interest with 44,000 and we're going to um, create a non-controlling interest in the statement of financial position with 44,000. And this comes from part C in our analysis of owner's equity. So this is the profit that the subsidiary generated in the current year, and we're just giving the non-controlling interest their share. So we have accounted for the, the pro forma journal entries to give NCI their profit. We also need to perform any um, pro forma journal entries to eliminate the intra-group dividend. So in the scenario, S declared a dividend of 20,000. So 80% of that dividend would have gone to the parents. But remember, S and P in the consolidated financial statements are seen as one company. So we need to eliminate the portion of that 20,000 that was paid to P. So if we go 20,000 multiplied by 80%, that gives us 16,000. So here we are eliminating the intra-group dividend. We are saying debit dividend income, 16,000. And this amount can be seen in our analysis of owner's equity in part C. Then we are debiting the non-controlling interest. We are giving the non-controlling interest their share of the dividend, which is 4,000 Rand. And we are crediting dividend class A, so all of these amounts here come from our analysis of owner's equity in part C. So you'll see the dividend is shown here, the full amount of 20,000, the parent's portion of 16,000, and the NCI of 4,000. Okay, so that is the dividend. Next, we need to have a look at the consolidated statement of changes in equity, okay? So not all of the information was given in the question to do this, but we'll just have a look at the retained earnings column. Sometimes in a test or exam, you can be asked to just do the retained earnings column, or you can sometimes be asked to do the whole statement of changes in equity. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, you need to know how to do the retained earnings column. So here, let's have a look at the opening balance on retained earnings. So the opening balance, we need to take that information in the question and calculate the opening balance. So first, we're going to start with P's um, Closing balance, okay? So they told us in the scenario the closing balance of retained earnings for P was 1,500 Rand. And then they are going to strip out the profits that P made during the year. So remember, we are trying to calculate the opening balance. So but we are starting with the closing balance. So the closing balance of P's retained earnings in their separate company was 1,500. And then in order to get to the opening balance for P, they're going to take out the current year profit for P and the dividends of P. So P made a profit after tax of 400,000, and then they declared a dividend of 40,000. So if we take the, op the closing balance for P of retained earnings minus the current year profit, that will help give us the opening balance. But we also need to add in S's post-acquisition profits. So if we um, go to our analysis, you can see that they have added in P's profits in the B section. So they are adding in the post-acquisition profits, after acquisition, before the current year, in order to give us the opening balance. So they are taking the retained earnings here of 256,000 minus the impairments of goodwill 
and that will give us 252,800. This is S's post acquisition profits. So if we add the amount of P, which is 1,140,000, plus the 252,800, which is from that part B in the analysis of owner's equity, that will give us an opening balance on the retained earnings of 1,392,800 Rand. So that is the opening balance. Now let's have a look at how did they calculate the closing balance. So now we want to know how did they calculate this closing balance of 1,900,000 over here in red. So we are going to take the closing balance of P. Remember we said this was given in the scenario. It was 1.5 million. Then we're going to add in S's total post acquisition profits to P, which is 411,000. And then if we add that up, that will give us 1,911,200 Rand. That is the closing balance on the retained earnings. Okay, so you're always taking P's portion plus S's post acquisition portion, and then that will give you the closing balance on the retained earnings. Then let's have a look at how do we calculate the total comprehensive income. So the total comprehensive income will consist of P's profit, which was 400,000 in the scenario, and then S's current year profit to P. So remember, P had a profit of 176,000 Rand that it allocated to P, and then less the dividends allocated to P of 16,000, that will give us 160,000. Less 1,600 in payment of goodwill. So if we add up P's profit plus S's current year profit to P minus the impairments of the goodwill for the current year, that will give us a total comprehensive income of 558,400 Rand. So we have so far looked at the opening balance and the closing balance and the total comprehensive income. And um, this dividend was also given in the scenario. It is um, P's dividend of 40,000. Okay, so that is example two. Uh, let's now move on to example three. So in example three, on slide 29, we again have another scenario where we need to uh, do all of the calculations. So on 1st of January 2019, P acquired 40,000 shares in S and paid 600,000. So that 600,000, that represents the purchase price. On this date, S had 50,000 shares in issue, a share capital of 500,000 and retained earnings of 200,000. The purchase was made at the at acquisition fair value of net assets acquired. In the year ending 31 December 2020, P made a profit after tax of 654,000 Rand and declared dividends of 50,000. S made a profit after tax of 400,000 and declared dividends of 40,000. The respective statements of financial position of the two companies are as follows, okay? And then they also tell us the recoverable amounts of the cash generating units are as follows. 31 December 2019, the recoverable amount is 745,000. And on 31 December 2020, the recoverable amount is 740,000. Okay, so here they are giving us P's statement of financial position and S's statements of financial position. So on consolidation, we are going to be adding these together and then also performing pro forma journal entries. This is the statement of profit and loss. They have given us P's statement of profit and loss and then S's separate statement of 
cost. Obviously, to perform the consolidated financial statements, you need to have the individual financial statements for P and the individual financial statements for S. So they are asking us to prepare the following statements for the P group for the year ended 31 December 2020. Um, we have to prepare the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. And then we need to prepare the consolidated statement of financial position and the consolidated statement of changes in equity in so far as the information permits. So step one, the consolidation procedures remain the same. We are going to eliminate the investment in the subsidiary against the equity of the subsidiary. Step two, we are going to eliminate the common or intragroup items. Step three, the consolidation. So we need to consolidate the remaining non-common items on a line-by-line -line basis in the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income and the statements of financial position. And then we need to prepare the consolidated statement of changes in equity. So step one, we are going to eliminate the investment in the subsidiary, which is 600,000 Rand in the books of P. Uh, P owns 80%, so they bought 40,000 shares and S has 50,000 shares in issue, so P owns 80%. The non-controlling interest is therefore 20%. So P owns 80% of the share capital of S. In order to calculate the values for the pro forma journal entries, we need to prepare the analysis of owner's equity of the subsidiary first. Okay, so this is a crucial step. Uh, you must do it even if they don't ask for it because there will be marks allocated here. So the scenario told us that the share capital of S was 500,000 on acquisition. The retained earnings was 200,000. P gets 80% of that. So we'll say 500,000 multiplied by 80% gives P 400,000. And the NCR gets 20%, which is 100,000. The retained earnings of 200,000 on acquisition, P will get 80% of that, which is 160,000, and the NCR will get their 20%, which is 40,000. Now we need to calculate if there's goodwill or gain from bargain purchase. So the consideration paid was 600,000 Rand. So we are comparing the 600,000 Rand, which is the purchase price, to what was obtained, which is 560,000. So the 600,000, the purchase price is greater than the equity purchased. So this results in goodwill of 40,000 Rand. Now we need to work out the part B and the part C, okay? It's easier to do the part C first. So the part C is the current year profit. So they told us in the scenario that S made profit after tax of 400,000 and declared dividends of 40,000 Rand. So P will get 80% of that. 400,000 times 80% will give us 320,000, and NCR will get 20,000, which is 20%, which is 80,000. The dividends of 40,000 will 80% will be allocated to P and 20% to the non controlling interest. And then we have an impairment of goodwill, and we'll have a look at the calculation just now. The impairment is 4,000 Rand, and that reduces the current year profits. Now that we have done part C, we can do part B. So part B, we are going to start with the closing balance of retained earnings of 860,000. This was given in our separate statements. So S had a closing balance of retained earnings of 860,000. So that is going to be our starting point, minus the 200,000, which is the retained earnings on acquisition, and then minus the 360,000, which is the current year profits, that will give us post acquisition profits of 300,000 Rand. And this relates to the period after acquisition before the current year. 
then that 300,000 Rand, 80% of that will be allocated to P and 20% of the 300,000 will be allocated to the non-controlling interest. So that is our analysis of owner's equity. We now need to perform the pro forma journal entries. So this is the same uh, journal entry you are familiar with. Obviously, we have all the amounts in the analysis of owner's equity, so that is going to help us. So we are going to debit share capital, which is 500,000 Rand. This is the amount that S had on acquisition date, and the retained earnings on acquisition was 200,000 Rand. The investment is 600,000 Rand, which is, this is the purchase price paid, and the non-controlling interest is 140,000. Goodwill is going to be 40,000. So these are the pro forma journal entries on acquisition dates. Then we are going to do the pro forma journal entries to give the non-controlling interest their share of the subsidiary's post-acquisition retained earnings up to the beginning of the current period. So they're talking about part B. So if we go to part B, the post-acquisition profits from acquisition up to the beginning of the current period resulted in the non-controlling interest getting 60,000 Rand. So we are simply showing that journal entry. We are saying debit retained earnings 60,000 because this relates to profit before the current year, which is why we are debiting retained earnings and we are crediting non-controlling interest with 60,000. Then we need to do the journal entries relating to the current year. So here we are debiting non-controlling interests, um, and that is in profit and loss of 80,000. And we are crediting non-controlling interest statement of financial position with 80,000. Here we are giving NCI their share of the current year profits. So if we go to our analysis of owner's equity, that 80,000 is found here in part C. So the subsidiary had a profit of 400,000, 20% of that went to the non-controlling interest. So that 80,000 Rand also needs to be journalized, which we have done here, okay? So, so far we have allocated the profit to the non-controlling interest. Now we need to take into account any intra-group dividend. So was there a dividend that the subsidiary declared? So yes, the subsidiary declared 40,000 Rand. 80% of that dividend was paid to P, which is the parent company. So P was paid 32,000. On consolidation, P and S are seen as the same company. Therefore, this amount needs to be eliminated. 20% of this dividend was paid to the non-controlling interest. So we need to show the journals for this. So here we are debiting dividend income. We are reversing the intra-group dividend. And we are debiting non-controlling interest. We are giving the non-controlling interest their share of the dividend. And then we are crediting dividends class A with 40,000. So we are showing the total dividend of 40,000. Then we're eliminating the portion of 32,000 that was paid to the parent. And then we are giving the non-controlling interest their portion. Now we need to look at the amounts for goodwill. Okay, before we can do the journal entries, we need to have a look at the calculation. So if we look at the calculation at 31 December 2019, they told us the recoverable amount was 745,000 Rand. We need to calculate what is the carrying amount of the cash generating units. So we are going to add in the share capital and retained earnings on acquisition. The share capital was 500,000 and the retained earnings was 200,000. That gives us a net asset value of 700,000 on acquisition. Then we need to add in the goodwill. So the goodwill was 40,000 Rand 
Um, that's what we calculated in our analysis of owner's equity. But remember, we said that 80% of this belongs, sorry, this represents 80%. So we need to gross this up to 100%. So we are going to say 40,000 divided by 80 multiplied by 100. That will give us 100% of goodwill. So that is 50,000. And then we're going to add that into the net asset value. And that will give us a total carrying amount of 750,000. So we are going to compare that carrying amount of 750,000 we are going to compare that to the recoverable amount, which is 745,000. So the carrying amount is greater than the recoverable amount. So we therefore have to impair this amount. So we are going to um, impair goodwill. So the impairment amount is 5,000 Rand, but the parent only gets 80% of this. So we're going to say 5,000 Rand multiplied by 80%. And that will give us 4,000 Rand. So this is the impairment of goodwill that belongs to the parents. Okay. So that is the impairment at 31 December 2019. So because it happened in the prior year, when we do all of our pro forma journal entries, we need to process this again, but we are going to debit retained earnings. So we're going to debit retained earnings with 4,000 Rand which is the parent share of the impairment. This is in the consolidated financial statements. And we're going to credit accumulated impairment loss goodwill with 4,000 Rand. Then we need to work out, was there an impairment in 2020? So we also need to work out the impairment for 2020. So the net asset value was 700,000. Remember, we just um, impaired goodwill in the prior year. So goodwill on acquisition was 40,000, but we impaired it in 2019 by 4,000 Rand. So the carrying amount of goodwill was 36,000. We now need to um, put that in our calculation. So that 36,000, that represents 80% of goodwill. So we need to gross this up. So we are going to say 36,000 divided by 80 multiplied by 100. That will give us 45,000. The carrying amount is therefore going to be 700,000 plus the 45,000. That will be 745,000. This is the carrying amount, and we need to compare the carrying amount to the recoverable amount. So the recoverable amount of the cash generating unit was 740,000 in 2020. So the recoverable amount is lower than the carrying amount. So therefore, we need to bring the carrying amount down, and we do that by processing an impairment of 5,000 Rand. That impairment, though, we need to allocate the parents their share of the impairment, which is 80%. So we're going to take the 5,000 multiplied by 80% equals 4,000 Rand. So that impairment of goodwill is 4,000 Rand in 2020. So let's just process our journal entry for that. So here we are in the current year 2020. We are going to debit impairment loss with 4,000 Rand. And we are going to credit accumulated impairment loss with 4,000 Rand. So that is the impairment for goodwill. Now we need to do our consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. So here, remember, we are adding 100% of P to 100% of S from date of acquisition on a line-by-line -line basis. When we look at the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, we will get the net profit or loss attributable to the non-controlling interest must be shown separately in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Total comprehensive income attributable to the non-controlling interest, this will be shown separately in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year. 
So let's have a look at our statement. So they gave us um, these figures previously. So if you want to follow, you can have a look at the at the figures previously given. Okay, I'm just going to that slide. Okay, so P had a profit before investment income of 1,200,000 rand and S had 625,000. So we're going to add those two together. Where we have dividend income, remember P received a dividend of 32,000 from S, but we need to, we eliminated that by processing the pro forma journal entry. So in the consolidated column, that is zero. Then we had an impairment loss. So remember the goodwill is shown in the statement of financial position, but the impairment loss is shown here in the consolidated statement of profit or loss. Then we have our profit before tax item. Um, so we have 1,034,000 for P and 625,000 for S. This 36,000 is the total of those two pro forma journal entries. So consolidated, we have a profit before tax of 1,623,000. And then the tax consolidated amount, we add P and add S, and that will give us a consolidated, amu consolidated amount of 605,000. Then profit for the year, um, we will simply be adding P plus S. So we'll say 654,000 plus 400,000 in S. And then the pro forma journal entry total is brought down, which is 36,000. So this will give us a consolidated figure of 1,018,000. And then our total comprehensive income is the same because we didn't have anything in other comprehensive income. Then we need to give the, we need to split this between owners of the parents and the non-controlling interest. So if you go to your analysis of owner's equity on slide 36, you'll see that the NCI share of profit is 80,000. And then that gives us 938,000 for owners of the parent. So here you will take the non-controlling interest amount from our analysis of owner's equity in part C on slide 36. And then the owners of the parent will be the balancing figure and in this scenario, it is 938,000. So that is our consolidated statement of profit or loss. Then we have our statements of financial position. So here we are adding 100% of P limited and 100% of S limited on a line by line basis for the assets and the liabilities. The equity section will consist of equity attributable to owners of the parent and the non-controlling interest. So here, this is the separate financial statements of P and the separate financial statements of S. So now we are going to prepare the consolidated financial statements. Um, so this is the analysis of owner's equity. This um, will help us with some of the pro forma journal entries. So property, here we are simply adding um, P and we are adding S. Okay, so for property, plants and equipment, P had 1,180,000. S had 770,000. So that gives us a consolidated amount of 1,950,000. P uh, purchased 80% in S, so P paid 600,000 Rand. In the separate financial statements, this 600,000 is shown as an investment. On consolidation, we need to eliminate this amount. So the consolidated amount is zero for the investment in a subsidiary because we process a pro forma journal entry. 
Then remember, we had goodwill of 40,000, and then we had impairment losses of 4,000 Rand in 2019 and 4,000 Rand in 2020. This gives us a consolidated goodwill figure of 32,000. Then we have trade and other receivables. P's portion is 440,000 and S's portion is 115,000. And this will give us a consolidated trade receivables of 555,000. Then we had inventory of 390,000 in P's books and S had 194,000 in their books, and this gives us a consolidated inventory of 584,000. And for bank, P had 269,000, S had 298,000, and this gave us a consolidated figure for bank of 567,000. Then we have equity. So here P had a share capital of 900,000, and S had share capital of 500,000. And then remember we processed pro forma journal entries to eliminate the share capital amount. So this gives us a consolidated figure of 900,000. And then we had retained earnings. So P had a closing balance of retained earnings of 1,804,000. And S had a closing balance on retained earnings on 860,000. <clears throat> and we processed pro forma journal entries here to um, all of the previous amounts processed to retained earnings will add up to this 332,000. This 8,000 consists of the impairment to goodwill. So once we process our pro forma journal entries, we have a consolidated retained earnings of 2,324,000. And then we give the non-controlling interest their share. This 272,000, this will come as the total figure on the non-controlling interest column. Then we have uh, liabilities. So our liabilities here are trade payables. P had trade payables of 175,000 and S had trade payables of 17,000. This will give us a consolidated trade payables amount of 192,000. So this is our consolidated statement of financial position. Now we need to prepare the statement of changes in equity. So the statement of changes in equity must only show amounts attributable to the parents in the reserve accounts. A separate column of total equity of the parent is shown then next to that, a separate column for the non-controlling interest will be shown. The last column on the right will be called total equity, and this will add up the total equity of the parent and the non-controlling interest. So here we need to uh, work out what is the opening balance of the retained earnings. They gave us the closing balance for P and S in their separate financial statements. We were told what the dividends were that P and S declared, and we were given the total comprehensive income. So we can actually work backwards to calculate this opening balance. So for S, we'll take the closing balance of 860,000 plus the dividends of 40,000 minus the total comprehensive income of 400,000 that will give us the opening balance of 500,000. For P, we had a closing balance of 1,804,000. To get the opening balance, we'll add the dividends of 50,000 minus the total comprehensive income of 654,000, and that will give us an opening balance of 1,200,000. Okay, so now we have calculated the opening balances. Now we can do our consolidated statement of changes in equity. So here we had an opening balance on share capital on 900,000 Rand and um, the retained earnings of 1,436,000 will consist of P's opening balance of retained earnings of 1.2 million plus the the post-acquisition profits 
of 236,000 from the analysis of owner's equity. So if we add those two, we'll get an opening balance of retained earnings of 1,436,000. Then we'll add the share capital and retained earnings, and that will give us a total amount of 2,340,000. And then our non-controlling interest will be 200,000. This will also be from our analysis of owner's equity. Then we have total comprehensive income, this will come from the consolidated um, statements of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. So the parents portion was 938,000 and the non-controlling interest portion for the current year was 80,000. And then in the total equity column, if we add the total parent plus the non-controlling interest, that will give us 1,018,000. Then we have the dividend paid of 50,000 um, and then the non-controlling interest share of the dividend paid by S, which is 8,000. That will give us total equity for the group of 58,000. Then for our closing balance, share capital is 900,000. There were no movements for the year. Retained earnings, we can calculate the closing balance by taking the closing balance on P, which was 1,804,000 plus 520,000. That is from the analysis of owner's equity. That is S's, um, it's the total amount on the AOE, which is 520,000. So it's the total figure at the bottom. And that will give us a total retained earnings of 2,324,000. So we can total the share capital and the retained earnings, and that will give us 3,232,000. And then the non-controlling interest is 272,000. That will also agree to the total on the analysis of owner's equity. And then the total equity is 3,504,000 for the group. Okay, so that is our consolidated statement of changes in equity. Okay, so that is um, that example finished. Now we just have a few short examples here. Okay, so remember, so, so far we have looked at intragroup transactions and we have looked at dividends. But it is common for non-current assets to also be sold within the group. So this means that S could sell an asset to P or P could sell an asset to S. For the purpose of preparing the consolidated financial statements, the assets need to be valued as if the sale had not occurred. Okay, So if there is a sale from S to P or from P to S, it is fine in their separate financial statements. But on consolidation, these two companies are seen as one company. Therefore, it's as if we have moved the asset from one room to another room. So therefore, if there is a sale between P and S of an asset in the consolidated financial statements, we have to prepare, we have to pretend that the sale never took place. So this means that the non-current asset must be restated to the original cost or the revalued amount. And any profit or loss on the sale will need to be eliminated. So because the separate entity that acquired the asset would be depreciating the assets on the basis of the new cost, this might be more or less than the original cost. OK, so there's a need to adjust any depreciation as a result of the intergroup sale um, for the non-current assets. So from the group's perspective, no gain or loss should be recorded in the consolidated financial statements. So it is fine to have profit um, for this intergroup sale in the separate financial statements, but on consolidation, these two companies are seen as one company. Therefore, we need to strip out any profit. Okay. So here we have an example on one, this is example A, on 1 April 2020, Eddie acquired 100% of Sandy for 850,000, representing the fair value of the consideration transferred. 
On this date, Sandy had a share capital of 500,000 and retained income of 300,000. All the assets of Sandy were fairly stated on acquisition date. On 1 April 2020, Eddie sells an item of plant to Sandy for 780,000. So this plant originally cost 81 million, was four years old and had accumulated depreciation of 400,000 at the date of sale. The remaining useful life of the plant is assessed as six years. So they're asking us to prepare the journal entries relating to the sale in the books of Eddie. So that is the separate financial statements of Eddie. Then we have to prepare the journal entries in the separate financial statements of Sandy. Then we need to prepare the pro forma journal entries as at 31 March 2021. So in Eddie's separate financial statements, it is fine to have the sale and record it because these are the separate financial statements. So in Eddie's books, Eddie sold this plant. He received 780,000 rand. So he says debit bank 780,000. Then he is doing the journal entries to dispose of this asset. So he is debiting accumulated depreciation plant. He is reversing this accumulated depreciation from his books. Then he is crediting the cost of the plant. He is taking out the cost um, out of his PPE. He is crediting plant cost 1 million and he is crediting profit on sale of plant. So the result of the sale of the plant is that a gain or profit of 180,000 will be shown in the books of Eddie. As there has been no transaction with a party outside the group, the gain recognized needs to be reversed and the cost and accumulated depreciation reinstated when we do the group financial statements. So this is the journal entries in Eddie's books. In Sandy's separate financial statements, she has bought this plant. She is debiting plant with 780,000 and crediting bank, which was the purchase price, with 780000 She now is going to depreciate this plant over the remaining useful life of six years. So she will take 780000 divided by six years, and that will give her depreciation of 130000 So in her separate financial statements, she will debit depreciation 130000 Credit accumulated depreciation plant with 130,000. In the group financial statements, though, we need to eliminate the sale and pretend it never happened. Because remember, from a group perspective, these two companies, Sandy and Eddie, are seen as one company. And we cannot sell an asset to ourselves. So we are going to reverse the sale and pretend it never happened. So the pro forma journal entries in the group financial statements are debit profit on sale of plants, 180,000. We are reversing the profit recorded in the books of Eddie and reinstating the accumulated depreciation. We are debiting plant cost. We sold it for 780,000. Eddie sold it for 780,000, but we're pretending that didn't happen. So we need to bring up the cost from 780,000 back up to a million. So we are debiting plant with 220,000 and we are reinstating the accumulated depreciation with 400,000. So as the sale was made by the parents, the profit is sitting in the parents' books. Therefore, the analysis of owner's equity will not need to be adjusted for this unrealized profit. So we are processing the pro forma journals here, but this profit will not be shown in the analysis of owner's equity because that is the subsidiary, that is not the parent. Here the parent sold this asset. Then every year, um, Sandy would be depreciating the asset for 130000 in her separate financial statements. However, from the group's perspective, the depreciation charge 
should be um, 600,000 divided by six years, which is 100,000. So from the group perspective, because they pretend this the sale never took place, they are depreciating um, a different cost. So they get 100,000 from the group's perspective, whereas Sandy in, this, in her separate financial statements has depreciation of 130,000. Therefore, we need to reduce the depreciation charge to show the original depreciation before the sale of the plant. So here we have a similar example. But here Sandy is the one selling the item of, oh wait, sorry, here Eddie sells an item of plant to Sandy. Okay. So on the 1st of April, Eddie acquired 100% of Sandy for 850,000. So this is two years after acquisition of subsidiary. So it's the same scenario. It's just looking at it two years after the acquisition. So two years on, we need to prepare the pro forma journal entries at 31 March, 2022. So every year they are going to process the same journal entries, but because this is the journal entry, the sale of the asset took place two years ago, instead of debiting gain or profit on sale, we are going to debit retained earnings with 180,000. So this 180,000, this is reversing the profit recorded in the books of Eddie in the prior year and reinstating the accumulated depreciation. So we're debiting retained earnings with 180,000. We are debiting plant with 220,000. We are taking the cost from 780,000 in Sandy's books to the 1 million that it should be from the group's perspective. We are crediting accumulated depreciation with 400,000 Rand. So we are simply um, reinstating this asset. We are pretending like the sale never took place from the group's perspective. Then we are going to have, um, because remember this is two years after the sale, we will have debit accumulated depreciation plant. So every year Sandy will be depreciating the asset with 130,000, but from the group perspective, they only show the depreciation at 100,000. So we need to reverse some of the depreciation. So for the current year, we are crediting depreciation 30,000. And then for the depreciation in the prior year, we are crediting retained earnings 30,000. And then the total of the credits will be debit accumulated depreciation plant 60,000. So this is the depreciation adjustment for the current and the prior period. Now we have an example C. So here we have a sale from the subsidiary, which is Sandy, to the parent. So on 1 April 2020, Eddie acquired 100% of Sandy for 850,000, representing the fair value of the consideration transferred. On this date, Sandy had share capital of 500,000 and retained income of 300,000. All the assets of Sandy were fairly stated on acquisition dates. On 1 April 2020, Sandy sells an item of plant to Eddie for 780000 So here Sandy is the subsidiary and they are selling the plant to Eddie who is the parent. In the previous example, it was the other way around. Okay, So here Sandy is the subsidiary and they are selling the plant to the parent. The plant cost Sandy $1 million was four years old and had accumulated depreciation of 400,000 at the date of sale. The remaining useful life of the plant is assessed as six years. So we need to prepare the journal entries relating to the sale of the plant in the books of Sandy. So in Sandy's separate financial statements, then we need to prepare the journal entries relating to the sale of plants in the books of Eddie, that is Eddie's separate financial statements. Then we need to prepare the necessary pro forma journal entries as at 31 March 2021. 
So in Sandy's separate financial statements, um, we're recording the sale. Sandy receives 780,000. So we are debiting bank 780,000. We are, Sandy is debiting accumulated depreciation plant with 400,000. They are reversing all the accumulated depreciation relating to this plant. They are crediting plant costs with 1 million. That is the original purchase price of the asset. They are reversing it in the books to show that they sold the asset. They are crediting profit on sale of plants. They had a sale, or sorry, a profit of 180,000 Rand. So the result of the sale of the plant is that a profit of 180,000 will be shown in the separate books of Sandy. As there has been no transaction with a party outside the group, the gain recognized needs to be reversed and the cost and accumulated depreciation reinstated from the perspective of the group. So it is fine to show the sale in Sandy's separate financial statements, but from the group's financial statements, Sandy and Eddie are seen as one company. Therefore, it doesn't make sense. You cannot sell an asset to yourself. So we are going to reverse the sale from the group's perspective, okay? But this is showing it from Sandy's perspective. Um, in Eddie's books, Eddie will show that they have bought this plant from Sandy, so they are debiting plant 780,000, credit bank 780,000. And every year, Eddie will depreciate this plant. They are debiting depreciation 130,000, and that is calculated by taking the cost of the plant of 780,000 divided by six. They are crediting accumulated depreciation plant 130,000. So that is an Eddie separate financial statement. Then from the group's perspective, the group, um, because Eddie and Sandy are seen as one company now, it doesn't make sense that they sold this asset to themselves. So from the group's perspective, we need to strip out this asset. So we are debiting profit on sale of plant from the group perspective with 180,000. We are processing these pro forma journal entries. We are debiting plant 220,000. This is reinstating the cost. Um, so Remember, the original cost was a million. It was sold for 780,000. So we are simply reinstating the cost back up to the original cost of a million. So it is already recorded as 780,000 um, in, in Eddie's separate financial statements. So now we are simply increasing that to a million. We are reinstating the original cost. When the asset was sold, the accumulated depreciation of 400,000 was written. Now we are reinstating it by crediting accumulated depreciation plant with 400,000. So we are reversing the profit recorded in the books of Sandy and reinstating the accumulated depreciation. So the results of the above pro forma journal entry is that the profit is removed and the asset and the accumulated depreciation are reinstated to that reported by Sandy prior to the sale. So because Sandy sold this asset to uh, Eddie and Sandy is the subsidiary, the analysis of owner's equity will be impacted. So we need to subtract the profit on sale from the profit for the year and add the accelerated depreciation back to the profit in the analysis of owner's equity. Okay, so you'll see in your practical and tutorial examples this week uh, that they show the sale of non-current assets within the company within the group so you will know you'll have to know how to deal with it okay so that is the end of the lecture on business combinations um, if you have any questions you are welcome to type it in the chat in the chat
Okay, guys, I know you have a 